Thank you, Lord, that you've given us these wonderful texts to uh, not only know what you, what your will is, but also, Lord, what your will is for us individually as a church. We're so thankful, Lord God, that you have not left us alone. You have left us your spirit, and you left us your spirit in such a way that we can understand it and apply it to our lives. All this we ask, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. We pray for those who have been ill, Lord. We pray for those who... Uh, have been sick, and we do individually pray for, and corporately pray for Paula, Lord, and we pray for her health to recover, Lord, pray for Frank and comfort upon his life, and that as a husband, Lord, he would be a servant to his wife and help her uh, through her illnesses right now, Lord, we ask you to bless her and keep her in Jesus' name, amen. If you didn't know, uh, Paula did have a, she had to go to the hospital on, on uh, Friday, and uh, pray guys, praise the Lord, she's okay. And uh, we did talk to Frank today, and uh, Frank says she's doing well. She'll be probably released today, right, Anthony? Okay. By God's grace, they'll do that. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. We'll just read this passage here. But in, this, uh, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you because you have come together, uh, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. That sounds like a, a rough passage to read at the beginning, but basically Paul is saying, what I'm going to talk to you about now, I'm not going to praise you for it. You really haven't been doing well on this particular matter, and that particular matter had to do with uh, the Lord's table, and that's the passage of today, the Lord's table. Now, in, um, in verse 1 um, and 2, would somebody want to read 1 Corinthians 11, 1 and 2, please? Just read it out loud so everybody could hear it. Eleven, one, and two. In this passage here, he says, "I'm praising you." And the second part that we read in verse seventeen says, "I'm not praising you uh, because of one thing they, they were doing some things right, but then on other parts they were not doing things well." And this part here has to do with the Lord's table. So Paul uh, changes gear. Remember, Paul is an apostle writing to a church in Corinth, and uh, he's writing to them about walking with Christ, and he's talked to them about a lot of issues already. You, you've, if you stayed with us, there's a lot of issues that have been covered. 1 Corinthians 11 is probably one of those uh, major chapters because we learn a lot from it. And one of the things we learn is things we do as Christians, things we do as Christians, that if we don't do them in the right way, can actually become very harmful to us. And what I mean by that is there are important things that every believer needs to do, especially when you become a Christian, you're converted, and uh, you learn how to pray. You learn how to uh, study the Bible. You learn how to study the scriptures. You learn how to fellowship. You learn how to do certain things. You learn uh, even uh, fellowship with other believers, come to church, sing songs. And one of the things we learn is also to take the Lord's Supper. And we did that last week. And that's an important thing to do. But when we do it the wrong way, it could also actually be uh, harmful to us. And what I mean by that is Paul is saying if we do the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, incorrect way, things can actually happen in your church that you don't want them to happen. You can actually do the Lord's uh, table. You can actually partake of the Lord's table, communion, in such a way that it actually uh, brings division among the church. And that's certainly something we don't want at all in this church. And it's a shattering revelation how these Corinthians were actually doing things. And I hope that doesn't scandalize you. hope it doesn't uh, offend you uh, because you can't even imagine drunkenness and things like that, uh, overeating drunkenness in the church at, at the Lord's table uh, when we're taking communion. So uh, there are other things as well that we need to consider that uh, maybe we don't get drunk here uh, at the Lord's table. Maybe we don't do those things, but do we do other things that are just as offensive to the Lord in terms of how things become divisive in the church? And that was part of the early church. That was part of the Corinthians and how they did things. And uh, I did want to remind you that... Uh, when we talk about, the, when Paul talks about the Lord's table here, it might sound a little bit different to you. And what I mean by different is they, they didn't take communion necessarily like we do here today or in our church. And uh, we, we long for the days that maybe we can have this consistently. What they had was called agape meals. And agape meals were basically a dinner that incorporated the Lord's table. 
And uh, that was included in very much the Jewish Seder. There was a Passover Seder that they, uh, that they enjoyed. Remember, the Lord's Table is based upon the Passover meal that the Jews have every year. Every year they have a, Lord's, uh, they have a, a Seder meal at the Passover meal. Uh, Jesus took a portion of that and became our Lord, the Lord's table, or became part of our communion. So don't want you to forget that part because this is truly, truly based on how the Lord gave the, the, the bread and the, and, the, and the wine to his disciples. It's based on the Passover meal that the Jews always have had, going back to Exodus. And the agape meals were simply a, 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 that the early church had, which is love meals, love feast. And these love feasts were very much part of the, Jew, uh, of the Jewish and believers' culture. And that the fact that when they took communion, it wasn't take communion and go home. It was, no, you, you got to know everybody that you were taking communion with. You got to know everybody that you're in fellowship with along with taking communion. Does that make sense to you? It wasn't just the spiritual side of it. You know, we, we, we become very spiritual, and that's a good thing. And uh, that, okay, this is the Lord's table. This is wonderful to take. But I think we also miss the other side of the coin, which the Lord instituted, that it was supposed to be fellowship. It's supposed to be fellowship. And he had it with his disciples. They had a meal together. And actually says after he had the meal, he gave the cup. And then they took the last cup, and that was the, uh, the cup in which the Lord instituted the new covenant. So we don't want to become so hyper-spiritual in one sense. and say, well, this is so holy, so sacred, so you know, sanctum, so important. And it is that we just take it for ourselves and we go home. And you say, I did my, I complied with what the Lord commanded me to do. That we also don't forget the fact that it was about fellowship. Getting to know the people that you were taking communion with. And what was interesting about agape meals is that everybody brought a meal together. So you brought like, you know, if you want to bring sandwiches, you know, you bring sandwiches and we'll spread them all on the table and, and, and we'll eat and then we'll take communion together. And if you think that's sort of uh, sacrilegious, but that's how the early church did. They brought meals together. Everybody shared a meal, uh, they ate together, and then in the midst of that, they share communion. Very different, isn't it, than our traditional, maybe thoughtful way of doing things where, you know, it's, it's very, you know, solemn, it's very sacred, it's, and it's all important. It's, I'm not denying that. But we miss that other part, don't we? We miss that fellowship part. And so we have done that before here, I think, agape meals, and I don't think we do them enough. But uh, part of it has to do with probably because it takes a lot of work, and and uh, I, I did want to share a little bit of a secret on that. Sometimes when we do ask for Passover meals, or sorry, pass, I guess Passover meals or agape meals, it ends up being one or two people that do it. And, and that's really hard. And that's why I think it's uh, sometimes hard to do. So I would encourage our fellowship, not because I'm commanding it, but to say if we're going to do it, I think we should do them and have everybody participate and somehow, yeah. some way participate it and um, be able to enjoy a Seder if it is a Seder meal, I got copy meal together. But uh, so anyway, those two things are important. Let's get to the first point. First point is the first five verses, 17 to 22. I guess that's six verses. But Paul rebukes him, plain and simple. And if that offends you, well, I guess the Bible offends us, right? Paul rebukes him, says, look, when you get together, it's for the worse. Can you imagine saying that about a church? When you guys get here, you know, you leave worse than when you came in. It's, it's almost like, well, why not, you know, we shouldn't get together. Yeah, that's what Paul is saying. It's it, it better off that you didn't get together than get together and leave the church worse off. Why were they getting worse off? Can somebody read 18 to 22, please? And you'll get to see the feeling of why they were, uh, Paul is telling them that you're worse off. 18 to 22, stand up and read it. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. Some of you go ahead with your own private suffers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Amen. Uh, oh, 22. Yeah. 22. Yeah. Don't you, have the, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by, by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this manner. So Paul tells them, I'm not going to sing your praises. You're doing things wrong. What was wrong? What were the problems? Well, first of all, 
when the believers came together in one place, they were divided. There were cliques. And uh, some people like to hang out with this family, and some people like to hang out with that family, and, and this family couldn't go to that side, and this side couldn't go to that side, and it became cliquish. It became a terrible thing. And cliques are a terrible thing, don't get me wrong. Uh, there are people that we enjoy being with in our fellowship, absolutely, without a doubt, but not to the exclusion of others. Not to the exclusion of others. Otherwise, it becomes a click. Now, we have fought very, very hard, and I mean fight very hard spiritually in both spiritual sense and the uh, thoughtful sense of not having cliques in this fellowship. And it's been, it's, it's been so much successful. I said we really can't prevent everything to happen, but we really would preach against cliques and, 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 and uh, sort of divisions and groups and special, special groups that nobody else can come and uh, to the exclusion of others. So Paul is saying you have an outward unity. You come together. You look like you're together. But when you really come down to the, to the real crux of the matter, your assembly is divided. This person doesn't associate with that person and vice versa and all this stuff. So cliques are terrible things. And wherever there's some fellowship, there's always a, tension, there is a potential for cliques. And so fellowship together with other people is really, really important. And like, verse 19, unlike modern unions today, Paul says, look, there's heresies. This is the word heresy there. It's the word for factions or divisions. Paul uses the word heresy there, and that's what the word heresy means. It means to divide. And it's interesting because Paul says, there must be some heresies among you to prove what is right. Sometimes God allows these things in churches or, or churches in general, in individual churches or churches in general, that you could see what is wrong so you can know what is right. You know, how do you know a, what a click is <laughs> when you see what a click is not? You know what I'm saying? Like, th there's fellowship, and then you see a click, and you go, wait a minute, that's not like this. That looks wrong, and that's what Paul is saying. Sometimes there's got to be divisions among you to prove what is right, to prove uh, what is false, and to prove what is right, so we will actually be able to know what God wants for our lives, and we must... Uh, allow the Lord to do this. And sometimes that happens, and even to the best of our abilities, divisions happen, and what is, the, what is it for? Well, it's not good, but God allows it for one reason, one particular reason, particular this, there's many other ones, but uh, that you could see what is false, you could see what is right, and you could see what is wrong, and who's not of the Lord, and who's faithful, and who's not. And that's really why because yeah, people ask me, why, Pastor, well, there's so many false things, and sometimes there's false things in churches and teachings and stuff like that. Well, obviously, the Lord's not doing that in the sense of he's trying to fool us. The Lord is allowing factions or divisions to happen to prove what is right and what is false. Right? In the Old Testament, you had the story of Korah and Moses. And literally, Moses had to say, okay, you who are for the Lord, stand on one side. You who are for Korah or against, or against the Lord, stand on the other side. But don't, you know, he warns them, don't have anything to do with these men, though. Don't have anything to do with these men. And surely, it was a division, literally like that. The earth split, and uh, Korah and his followers were actually uh, thrown into the pit. It was God's judgment on them. That's how severe. God did not approve of divisions like that, but he allowed it to happen up to a point. And then the split happened. Now, uh, when should you split? That's another question that happens all the time. When should you divide? I, I, uh, from, uh, like Paul says here, there must be divisions. When should you divide? And there are times where it's okay to divide from uh, others who don't preach the true gospel, who deny the certainty of the gospel, who deny things about scripture, who are denying and destroying and challenging, of course, the gospel the deity of Christ, and, and, and some essential doctrines. We're not going to go over every single one of them, but those in particular ones, the gospel, Christ, um, the deity of Christ, the person of God, the person of the Spirit. And, uh, and there are some who are destroying that. And it's right for believers to separate from that. It absolutely is right. That's what Paul says there must be. Otherwise, you won't know what is right. <laughs> you see what is false, and you see what is right, and you take a side. And um, also moral issues, moral issues of sin, and moral issues that will corrupt the body of Christ. You saw it earlier in the book, 1 Corinthians 5. There was a man committing a heinous sin with his uh, stepmother, most likely, you know, took, taking her as a, as a wife. And, um, and Paul says, you've got you to remove the leaven. You've got you to gotta divide from this situation. Otherwise, it's going to corrupt the whole person. But here's Paul's point, verse 20. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat 
the Lord's Supper. Wait a minute, Paul. I thought we were getting together to eat the Lord's Supper. Why are you saying we're not eating the Lord's Supper? For one reason only. It had not, it became not the Lord's Supper. It became their supper. It became their supper. Well, how would you know? Look at verse 21. For that when you're eating together, each one takes his own supper first. And one is hungry and the other one is drunk. Things were so bad in Corinth that when they took the Lord's Supper, uh, it, wasn't, it didn't become the Lord's Supper anymore. It wasn't about fellowship anymore. It wasn't about being with the people of God or taking communion. It was about feeding their own appetites, feeding their own appetites, doing what they want, doing whatever they wanted. And Paul could not accept this. May we never get to the point in our fellowship where um, things that we do for the body become so dreadful that we go, oh, I love to do it, but there are just so many people that come. And I just, oh, I can't serve that many people. You know, pastor, don't announce it because we just don't want people there. Why are we doing it then, right? That's, may we never get to that dread that we become so focused on, well, what about me? That we lose sight of what really is important, fellowship and serving one another. That's what you come. That's one of the reasons why you came. I hope you knew that, right? Uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't the service necessarily. It wasn't uh, as well as Christian sings. and everything. It wasn't even for that as well. It was to honor the Lord it was to be with each other. It was to worship God together. And uh, God honors that, by the way, a sacrifice you made. And so the church was coming for a meal, but it was their meal. You come to eat on your own. And the church came together, and this is uh, typical, um, especially in Corinth, it was the same way. Uh, the rich will come, and they will bring more of the food. Obviously, they were wealthy. They would bring more of the food. And they would come together, and of course, um, many of them probably didn't work or had their own businesses or whatever it was. So they were able to have more flexibility to come. And they would bring all the food. And guess who ate it? Them and their cliques, right? Them and those who aligned themselves with them. And, uh, but they wouldn't observe the Lord's table. Why? Because the scramble would begin. People would eat the food, right? It says here, he takes his own supper first. They, they didn't even wait for anybody else. One's hungry, and, got, and the other one is drunk. Things became so bad that people just stuffed themselves and, and drank the wine so much. This is at a church. It's not a, a, you know, at a, or, you know, a, a, a civic center or, uh, or some, you know, I don't know. What are the places that do that? You know, your, uh, the, 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 the Christmas, uh, Christmas dinner uh, at your work. Um, some of them look like that sometimes. But, uh, you know, everybody gorges themselves and everybody drinks to the point where by the time everybody else shows up, Everybody has eaten and everybody's drunk already. And some were hungry because many of the poor were slaves. Many of the poor were slaves. In fact, you can see that. Oh, where is it? Uh, verse 22. Uh, somebody want to read that out loud so we can hear it? Verse, just verse 22. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on. Oh, no, verse, just 22. Oops, sorry. That's okay. Don't you have... That's right. And so the church who came for a common meal actually became more concerned for their own appetites rather than the Lord's. And so don't you have home, Paul says? Don't you have homes? You know, if you want to eat that, you should eat it at home, not at the church. Don't exclude everybody because of your desires to eat for yourself. Now, let's look at the second point, verse 23 to 26. Somebody want to read that, please? Twenty-three to twenty-six. That's right. Amen. 
Oh, 26, sorry, correct. Yeah. Just for a brief discussion, proclaim the Lord's death. Somebody turn to Acts chapter 2, please. Acts chapter 2, 46 and 47, please. Uh, as, as I go through it, and then when you're, somebody's ready to go, let me know. Uh, one of the things that Paul is reminding them is, reminding them, how did this start? Why do we even have the Lord's table? And it all goes back to Jesus. But let's look at see how the early church actually applied this uh, to themselves. And that is in the book of Acts 42, 46, and 47, if you don't mind, please. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were to be saved. So uh, there's always arguments by scholars that say, well, when it says they ate uh, from place to place, they ate in their homes, were they just eating meals or were they taking communion? And scholars argue all the time about it. And the answer, very simply, is they were both because they were eating meals and they were taking communion together. That's how the early church did it. And by the way, the early church, uh, going back to the days of Jesus, this is how, by the way, this is how, uh, I know we see Michelangelo's you know, painting of the Last Supper. Uh, but unfortunately, it probably looked more like this, uh, what they call triclinians, triclinians, where everybody leaned on their elbow and ate. Uh, more modern ones kind of look like this. This is typical Middle East. And um, so, sorry to burst your bubble on the Last Supper, but uh, this is really more how it looked. And Paul is reminding them, look, the early church ate in homes. The early church took agape feasts. The early church did it together. That was the original intent of the First Supper, was to do it the way the Lord had intended to do it. And Paul says, I'm going to tell you what I received from the Lord. And this is kind of an important verse. If, you're, uh, if you study the New Testament, one of the things that is so fascinating about the, the, the New Testament, especially this passage here, is these are probably the first recorded words of Jesus in the Bible. Because Paul wrote Corinthians probably earlier than most Gospels were written. Uh, probably earlier than Mark. And so the Corinthians had something that nobody else had at that moment was the recorded words of Jesus. And that is what Paul is referring to here. It says, I receive from the Lord that which I'm, I'm, I'm giving you what I received from the Lord the night that he was betrayed. He was going to give them something that at this point in terms of church history, no one had ever written on it. The Gospels weren't complete yet. Certainly John wasn't complete yet. Certainly Luke wasn't complete yet. Yet Paul is able to, from a direct revelation from Jesus, just like in Galatians, he says that my Gospel came from Jesus. It did not come from the Apostles. Is going to give them something that nobody else had at this moment. What was it? The very words of Jesus, as he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And this is the cup of the new covenant. And what Jesus was referring to was exactly that. Jesus instituted this. You're doing something that Jesus instituted. It wasn't the church. It was something Jesus did. And um, on the eve of the cross, on the eve of the cross, Jesus did something for us. Something for us, his blood, his, uh, his display of selflessness, right? And this is where the Corinthians were so selfish, right? It was so different than what Jesus did. They should have remembered that the Lord ordained this, not, not humans. And the Corinthians were completely out to lunch. In fact, um, I guess I, you can put it up here. Uh, Luke 22. Uh, this is the cup of the new covenant established in my blood, which is poured out for you. That's uh, found in Luke. But this is something Paul was referring to. Paul was referring to what Jesus said. And, of course, Luke brought it up. In Luke 22, this is the, the Last Supper. This is the Last Supper in what Jesus was talking about. But Paul says, don't you remember that this is what the Lord ordained? In the day of human wickedness, when all wickedness was displayed on Jesus, this is where Jesus instituted this wonderful meal. And the day that he was betrayed is the day Jesus brought this meal. How was it observed? Well, it's very simple. He took the bread... And he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he says, I think it's right here, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And that word remembrance is simply the word that means don't forget me. Don't forget me. It's really uh, not, not to have amnesia. Anamnesis in Greek, if you're interested in that. Anamnesis. Anam is the opposite. 
nieces is to forget, like amnesia, right? There's people that suffer from amnesia, and that happens. And uh, Jesus is referring to this fascinating thing. It's not to have amnesia. Do this in remembrance of, and I want you to remember this part, me, because we're going to come back to the end of that. Do this in remembrance of me. You do this in remembrance of me. You remember me. You recollect what I've done for you, because the bread is the way that we remember Jesus. It was Christ-centered, and it was the way we remember Jesus. When the rich came and took the bread, and I'm sorry, took the supper, who did they think of the most when they ate and drank and got drunk and got full? Who did they think of the most? Themselves. The opposite of Jesus. Look at verse 25. Look at verse 25. In the same way, he took the cup. And in the same way he took the cup, and the cup speaks of the new covenant. And look how it's written. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It's very specific, isn't it? You know, it's not just saying, you know, th- you know this, is, this is my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. And so this speaks of, of course, Jeremiah. And we've been studying Jeremiah a little bit. And Jeremiah says that there'll come a time when the old covenant will be replaced and the new covenant will come. And that new covenant will have the spirit of God in that person's heart. They will be transformed. They'll be changed. And it'll come because God will write the law in their hearts. And that would only come when the Messiah would die and shed his blood for us. The new covenant would come and the new covenant would take place uh, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Jeremiah 30, uh, 31. And uh, that covenant was not only with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, right? That, that was for them. But Gentiles benefit from it. Now believers can actually enter into that covenant that he established. And that new covenant replaces the old covenant with Moses, with uh, uh, the one Moses brought. And that will actually be personal. That is the key to that new covenant. It's actually personal, right? It's not national like the old covenant, right? It's not national. It's personal. Individual Jews can be saved. Individual Hispanics can be saved. Individual Americans can be saved. Individual uh, Venezuelans can be saved. Individual Eskimos can be saved. Individual Australians can be saved. It wasn't just national. It was absolutely personal. And that would happen on the day that Jesus would bleed and die for our sins. So through the shedding of blood, Jesus took this cup and it says, this is the new covenant. In my blood, all the benefits of the new covenant comes to those who have been cleansed by his blood. So what he's saying, right? And verse 26, for as often as you do it. So that word often is continually do it. It's continually do it. You do this and drink, uh, eat the bread and drink the cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so there's a proclamation as well. There's an announcement. There's a proclamation. The Lord's death until we come, until he comes. How long shall we do this? Until he comes. Until we come together with Christ. We take the bread. We take communion. We take uh, uh, the, 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 the cup. And we remember what he did for us, the new covenant. It's the meaning of the cross, the blessing of the cross. And then we look to the future. And I I think we do that in our fellowship here. When we take communion together, we always concentrate on the gospel, focus on what the elements mean, and look forward to what the Lord is going to do. Because we proclaim his death. We proclaim the gospel in that sense. If you think about it, when you take, take communion, you are proclaiming the gospel. You're proclaiming the gospel in that sense of, I am joining myself to Christ and his people, his blood, his body. And of course, now I am one. I'm going to be one in union with Christ. Just like God joined me to his death, his resurrection, through conversion and through baptism, I'm joined with Christ now. I am continually remembering him. I'm continually committed to the gospel because these elements are right before me. I'm taking them on myself. I'm taking them within my body. And they have now become part of my body, the, the, the cup and the, and the bread. I mean, not the cup, but the juice, of course. And this is different than what the Corinthians were doing. The Corinthians were selfish and greedy and divided the church in such a way that Paul had to rebuke them and divided them, uh, and, and rebuked them, and reminded them that they were divided. Rebuked them, and reminded them that they were divided. So let's look at the next one, verses 27 through 33. 27 through 33, somebody volunteered to read, actually, it's actually 34, sorry, it should be 34, 
It's 34 verses here. I don't know what I was thinking. But 27 through 34, the last few verses. interesting, Paul says, eat at home again, right? So it's, it's, they, they, seemingly they had a problem in terms of how they ate together. But instructions and regulations. Paul tells them, this is how you're to do it. Now he told them, rebuked them, told them what it meant, what the, uh, what the Lord's Supper meant. And now he says, I want to instruct you and, and, and bring some regulations to this. And this is such a, uh, uh, you know, just follow Paul's example, such a good pastor, such a good teacher. Not only points the problem out, tells them why the problem is such a big problem because of what they're doing. It's such a big deal because this is the Lord's table. This is, this is the Lord's death and resurrection. But then he tells them, this is how you fix it. This is how you fix it. And so Paul gives them what to do. You need to observe it. Uh, the supper, the, Lord, the Lord's Supper is sacred. You can go on observing it like this. You can go on thinking that you're going to just take it in an unworthy manner. And what, I, what that one worthy manner means that it's the Lord, uh, they're going to have to get their lives right with the Lord before they take it. And what was I doing? This, yeah, the Lord's table. In light of what I'm saying, Paul says, look at this, unworthy manner. Where's that verse? Verse 27, unworthy manner. Some people have said, Pastor, I can't take the Lord's, t- uh, the Lord's Supper because I can't, I'm unworthy. I'm totally unworthy. None of us are worthy. So who can take it? Paul is not saying we're all unworthy. We're all unworthy. We're all undeserving of it. What Paul is saying is unworthy manner. Look at that verse again. Unworthy manner. What that means is um, we have to be in right relationship with the Lord. Amen. We should not come in an unworthy way, an unworthy manner, um, that is different to what the, the table stands for. What does the table stand for? Anybody, what does the table of the Lord stand for? We have to take the Lord's table. What, what, what does the table mean? What does the supper mean? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say equality, that everybody's okay. the same. Okay. Doesn't matter, doctor, lawyer. Right. We're all one in Christ. Anybody else? Fellowship. What's that? Fellowship. Fellowship. Salvation, right? It's the blood, meaning the, the, symbol is, uh, the symbol of the blood of Christ, the symbol of the body of Christ. It's there. It's the gospel. Uh, and when you come to that table, don't forget about those things. Don't forget that this is what the table proclaims. What is the table proclaiming to you? you know, what does it yell at you and say, hey, this is what you're doing it? It's a broken body of the Messiah. It's the spilled body of the Messiah. Look at the table. Look how he came. Uh, and look how they came. He came humbly. He came willing to serve. The Corinthians came in a horrible way. They came looking for their own interests, looking for their own ways, looking to be selfish, looking to be greedy. And if you come to the table in a similar manner, divisive, thinking of ourselves, thinking against others, not humbly submitting to the Lord's way, then we are guilty. We are guilty just like those who spilled and broke the body of Jesus. This is a serious thing. Paul is not pulling punches here because he's saying the regulation is unworthy manner Uh, Yes, we're all unworthy, but are you doing it in an unworthy manner? I mean, are you coming to the Lord in such a way that really it's different than what the table proclaims? Think about it that way. My attitude and behavior is it different than what the table proclaims. And uh, in verse 28, uh, every man must examine himself. Nobody should just come to communion and say, well, this is like every other communion. You always take it on the last Sunday of the month, right? Yeah, Yeah, okay. Oh, it's the last Sunday of the month. I know. It's, it's a way that you can have to examine yourself thinking of this. Why am I taking this? Why was it given to me? 
And do I have the frame of mind to know that this is the table of the Lord, not my table, right? Because you can say, well, uh, the Corinthians, this is my table. This is what I'm going to do. And uh, a self-examination. Look at that verse again. Examine yourself, says Paul. Examine yourself. Now, Paul's always talking about examining ourselves in other passages of Scripture. The examination is, don't just show up and eat. Food and drink. And think for yourself. And Paul rebuked them. They weren't thinking about the Lord. Because what's the point of the Lord's table? Isn't it Jesus? The centrality of the Lord's table is Jesus. And that did not cross their mind. Why? Because all they thought about is, hey, did you bring the pie? Hey, did you bring the chicken? Hey, the, you know, Roy's table's got the chicken. We'll go hang out with Roy's table. Or if you've got the pies, you know, Gloria's got the pies. We'll go and hang out on the pie table. And there was no fellowship. There was divisions. There was greediness. There was selfishness. There were divisions among them, so no one didn't even like each other. Verse 29, for he who eats and drinks and judge, uh, drinks judgment to themselves, to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. Now, the body here has, of course, to do the body of Christ, but it's also the body of Christ, right? You're not discerning the, Lord, the Lord's body. You're not really thinking about who else is being affected by my behavior like this. All of us. All of us are affected by your behavior. And we're not discerning the Lord's body. When we all, it's, it's just this idea of selfishness, selfishness, greed, and wanting to think for ourselves and thinking that this is all there is. All there is is me, and what am I going to get out of it? What am I going to get out of it? Verse 30. For some reason, some have become weak, sick, and fallen asleep. Some have died, literally. God did not judge them in that way because he was mean. <laughs> Why would God, now here's a question maybe I had for you. Why would God chasten them that way? Why would God um, bring this illness? And, and, this, and, 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 and some of them, the word sleep there has to do with believers going to be with the Lord. So we know that they were believers. We know that they were saved. But why would the Lord go to such a drastic measure to get them to know this? What's his point? Anybody have any thought on it? Why would God... I mean, it's, it, it, some people would think, well, Pastor, this is seems severe. Sick? Death? I mean, is it that serious? The Lord doesn't want to lose anyone. And he will even intervene in the church to try to bring us back to himself. <laughs> If there's sin in our lives, he will bring us back to himself. But especially uh, the, the Lord's table is a way to get us back to the reality and the centrality of Jesus. If we have not been thinking that way, if we've not been approaching believers that way, uh, the Lord can intervene in the church. Now, you know, that's a thought, isn't it? It's his church, but oh, we get really nervous when God begins to move. You know, it's his church, but if God does something, oh, why? Why would he do that? Like if it's our church, <laughs> like if it was for me, you know, he has every right and capability of doing anything. Yes, sir. The Lord chastens those. He does, doesn't he? And he loved the Corinthians, no doubt. They were so wrong, but God still loved them, and and God had to remove their attitude and complacency, and show the. Well, what do you think of the rest? <laughs> what do you think of so and so? Hey, who was so and so? Well, not here. You know, would you straighten out a little bit? You know, if, if, if uh, I wouldn't want to do an example here, but, you know, if you heard about it, oh, man, I, just, I saw that brother, and he went to be with the Lord that fast. Well, it would straighten me out, too. <laughs> it would straighten me out to be, to be what God wanted me to be. You know, it's a way to get others to live holy lives and to say, you know, God intervenes in this church. You know, um, it, it's, it, could be, uh, it could be a dangerous thing to meet God sometimes. You think of Isaiah. Think of other men who wanted to die in his presence. I mean, to, to meet the living God, it's no easy manner. There's no, we shouldn't take it in such an unworthy manner. And this is what Paul is trying to say about the, the Lord's table. It's not just some table that you come. It's not your table. You know, you have your table at home, don't you? You want to you wanna eat a lot? You want to gorge yourself? You want to eat for yourself? Eat at home, Paul says. Best way to do it, eat at home. If you want to fellowship, though. If you want to honor the Lord, if you want to uh, discern the Lord's body, come to church, come to fellowship, take communion together, honor God with your life, honor God with your thinking and attitude and behavior, and honor one another and serve one another. Verse 33, so then my brother, when you come and eat, wait for one another. Remember, they weren't waiting. 
the rich people were eating earlier. The slaves who got out of work later came and there was no food. Verse 34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that, you're, uh, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. I will arrange when I come. And uh, so Paul finishes with this, this, uh, this information. If anyone's hungry, eat at home. You won't stand in judgment if you do it at home in a sense of, uh, uh, look, if you want to eat by yourself. But Paul say, look, I have more things to tell you. These are the important things. These are the essential things. When he comes, I'll tell you more. Right now, don't need to know. And the Lord is going to be honored. The Lord is going to be honored, and the body of Christ is going to be honored. And this was an urgent and important thing about the Lord's Supper. This is absolutely important. And the rest can wait, Paul says, until I show up. So what I wanted to do, it's a little bit different today. I want to talk about application. How do we apply this? So we, we did the exposition. We find out what it meant. Now let's apply it. But before let's apply it, let's pray. Because I think we need to pray understanding what the passage means and how we're doing it and uh, how we're going to move forward in doing it and applying in our lives because we may be guilty of some of this. We may not be. We may be guilty in thinking, well, maybe I have come to the Lord in an unworthy manner. Maybe I've taken it in a way that I shouldn't be. And I haven't thought of the Lord. I maybe I thought of myself and I thought, well, well, this, you know, when is this over? You know, that kind of thing. And, and, and we just take it for granted that it's just a, a normal last Sunday of the month. And, it's, um, and it shouldn't be like that. Um, so let's pray. Let's ask the Lord first. And then, uh, then we'll talk about application. Lord, we do know that these things are serious. These things are not maybe for the faint of heart or for someone who just casually parades through churches and, and doesn't think of the matter in which you stated this. Lord, we are thankful that you gave us these things. We are thankful that you have uh, taught us the right way through Paul and our brother, the pastor, the apostle, the, the missionary. He gave us these words, and these words were not to be taken lightly, but to really understand that in that church there were severe problems and Lord, and we don't want to fall into the same error. We don't want to fall into the same error. We may not be getting drunk. We might not be uh, eating on our own, maybe because we don't even have a meal for everybody here, Lord. But we could do it in the sense of our attitudes. We can not wait for somebody in the sense of our attitudes, in the sense of our uh, behavior and how we think of others, Lord. And so, Father, please forgive us that when we take communion, we're reminded of the Lord's table. Not my table. It's not mine. It's yours. And how we're to do it in such a way because you specifically gave us those things. And so, Lord, we commit to you and to your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, the application. Now, two things always come to mind when the application happens. Is when we talk about communion, there's always this. Pastor, what do you think about the Catholic Mass? And I said, well, what do you want to know about the Catholic Mass? I was a Catholic before. So um, I can tell you a little bit about it, but um, I don't know how much you want to know. Um, now, I will ask you a question, and then you tell me. Based on what you know about the Catholic Mass and communion, uh, is it different than what Paul just explained? Is it different than what Paul just explained? Okay, and um, can we see the differences? Can we see where the differences are, and can we see the error in one of the other? Because uh, either Paul is right, or the Catholic Church is right. Right, and this is where I, I want to bring the text. Now, there's a second application. Don't worry. It's not just a, uh, picking on the mass or anything like that. But I have Catholic families. I have Catholic friends. I have Catholic neighbors. Uh, very dear, lovely people in my life. And, uh, in fact, many of them believe that the mass is a means of salvation, meaning it's through the mass that you are going to be saved. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is not just their own understanding, but this comes straight out of the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, straight out of the catechism. So I didn't get it from a Protestant website. I didn't get it from, you know, Dave Hunt's book or anything like that. This came straight from the catechism, a catechism, uh, catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. So, and the reason why is there's always a question. Um, some believers come from the Catholic Church and say, it's so different. It's so different than, you know, I come to church. It's so different than what I used to do. It's so, you know, it's not this thing. It's a procession, all that. You know, why is it so different? Well, 
think of what Paul just said. We just read, really, what the, what the, uh, what the church, what the, what the New Testament church believed the communion was. But let me tell you what the catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, and then you make the decision if Paul is right or the, catech or the, or the Catholic Church is right. It says, the Blessed Eucharist is the source and summit of all Christian life, and bread and wine is changed into the body and, bo and blood of Jesus in a, in a transition called transubstantiation. The blood and wine is changed into the body, soul, and divinity of Christ when the words of consecration that Christ said are pronounced by the priest during the Mass. Jesus is actually living and present at the Eucharist as long as the, uh, as long as the appearance of bread and wine remain. Eucharist is to be worshipped as God, for the blessed Eucharist is God. The Mass is not a mere remembrance, but actually a representation, a replay of his death and continuation of his death and the same sacrifice. The Mass is the chief act of worship, the greatest worship offered to God for living in death. For, the living in, in, for living in death, the Mass is without limit because it's the same as the sacrifice of Calvary. In every Mass, the infinite merit of Christ is applied to us in a measure and disposition, and this is the actual Catholic doctrine, meaning that it is for God. We do this for God, and we do this. Oh, did it change? There you go. We do this for God, and we do it in such a way that it's the pinnacle. It's the pinnacle of everything we do, of worship. It is there. And, um, and it's, it's Christ who now becomes the, uh, the wafer, the bread, and Christ becomes uh, the blood, and it's in the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is God. It's Eucharist is worshipped, and Eucharist becomes uh, the full measure of God is found in this Eucharist, and it's given to all of us so we can partake of God. And, and uh, this is a, a replay of Calvary, a continuation and a replay of Calvary every time there's a Mass. Now, the reason why many Catholics, and when I was a Catholic, it was the same thing. The Mass was so important is because that, that was the reason. It's like you, you have to partake of this, otherwise you can't be saved. Um, and you're in danger if you don't go to Mass. That was, the, you know, on and on and on. And I did want to ask you, my friend, is it's based on what I just read, and I could read it again if you'd like to, or give you my paperwork, or you can look it up yourself. Uh, is it different than what Paul just said? Yes. Vastly different? A little bit different? Completely different? Right? And this is not to pick on anybody, because I know wonderful, wonderful Catholic families and stuff like that that have a hard time with this. They, they don't like it, they can't, but they don't have any other option because their family is oriented and geared toward this. So let's talk about a moment real quick. This is my body, Jesus said. Catholic Church says, well, this, there it is. This is his body. It's got to be that little bread, the little wafer. Um, Jesus said that in the context of the Passover meal. Remember, it's a Jewish meal. And he said that regarding the bread that they normally eat. Now, nobody in that table, at that table, uh, when Jesus was taking his communion, nobody said, well, Jesus, is, are, 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 am I eating you? Am I, am I taking you in? Because they obvi obviously knew that Jesus was standing right there. <laughs> so if you're sitting, you know, if you're Peter, John, or James, or whoever, and you were there, not Judas, right? You don't want to be that. Um, if you were there, and you were taking the bread, and Jesus meant, this is me, you would say, no, it's not you. Why? Because you're right there. Yeah. You see the point. Jesus was using very, very Jewish metaphor, just like he did all through the Gospels. Would anybody be confused if Jesus says, I am the door? Yeah. Would Jesus be a piece of wood? Absolutely not. Would, Jesus, would, would you ever be confused when Jesus says, I am the vine? Would you think Jesus is a plant? Jesus, you're the plant, you're right here. Nobody, nobody ever, why? We understand context. We understand how metaphors work in the Bible. Well, you do the same thing. Well, how do we do that? Um, ever somebody giving you a picture? And you say, look at the picture. And you say, oh, that so-and-so is in there in that picture. Don't you say that? Hey, that's my cousin, or that's Keith, or, or Rick, whoever, right? It, you know, in the picture. You don't mean that's actually Rick or Keith, or whoever, he's not a piece of paper, he's not an image on a piece of paper, that's not him, Keith is standing over there. You say that though, right, you say that, that's Keith, <laughs> but you don't mean that's 
personal Keith. That's not the man Keith. That's an image of Keith on the picture. You see, we use it in our language anyway. We just don't really think about it sometimes, right? That this is, this is Keith. This is, this is my body. <laughs> metaphorically speaking, no, you're standing. Yes, it is you metaphorically, but that's, you're standing right there, Jesus. I'm taking you in. I'm receiving you in into my life through this communion. I am fellowshipping with you. That's what the, the Jews would have understood. And so, in remembrance of me, Jesus said, in remembrance of me. Now remember, this is the Catholic Church doctrine that they say, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. No, that's not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is actually standing at the right hand of God. That's where he's at. Um, this is my body. Oh, sorry, remembrance of me. Uh, one of the greatest, when the disciples took the bread, right, um, they were going to take the bread with Jesus. But when he said, do it in remembrance of me, as often as you do it, there will be a time where Jesus would not be at that table. Am, am, I, just, am I clear? Okay. There will be a time where you would have to remember Jesus was there with you. The disciples was, were going to remember that at one time that chair was going to be absent. That chair was going to be empty. So you're going to have to think of him and remember him because one day he will be back. Do this in, until he comes that chair will be filled up again. But until then, you have to remember him. Right? Amen. Well, if he was there, you wouldn't have to remember him, right? <laughs> if Jesus was physically here, you wouldn't have to remember him. He would be here. I'm not playing games with words. I'm just giving you, like, just thoughtful, logical thought, right? It's the idea, the greatest concept is that Jesus is absent in this table. When we take the Lord's table, we come to the Lord's table, communion. Jesus is physically absent, but he's spiritually here. Through his spirit, he's here, but he's physically absent. But we do this until he comes. That's the point of doing it until he comes. Now, the whole aspect of this is my blood is also another concept, isn't it? This is my blood, Jesus. And uh, if somebody could read for me, uh, verse 25. Verse 25 of the chapter we just read. Verse 25. When Jesus said, this is my blood, the Catholic Church says, see, that's the blood of Jesus. Yeah, the wine is the blood of Jesus. But did Jesus really say it like that? Or how did he say it? Somebody read verse 25, loud and clear. In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. This is the cup. This is the new test. This is a new covenant. Another way of saying New Testament, by the way. This is the cup. The cup is the new, the new covenant. The cup is the new covenant in my blood, right? It's very specifically. Uh, it's very specifically in a sense that it's the new covenant that is being initiated through his blood. It's not Jesus changing his blood into the wine into blood. It's saying the new covenant, the cup is the new covenant. You know, when you take the cup, it's the new covenant. And what purchased the new covenant? His blood. It's connected to the new covenant, no doubt. But he's not saying that what you have in your cup is blood or protoplasm. He's not saying that. He's saying this cup is the new covenant. And what brought the new covenant to you is my blood that's going to be shed for the remission of sins. So when you do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said, in remembrance of me, uh, the catechism says it's for God. Paul says... You do this in remembrance of me. Who is it for? Yeah, I have to remember. God is fully aware, by the way. God is fully aware of what Jesus has done. He's standing at the right hand of God. I must remember that. What happens when I forget? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see me when I forget. That's where we come. That's where we remind each other. Remember the cup, remember the blood, remember the table, right? We examine ourselves. You proclaim it, right? Now, the Catholic Church says you, it's a replay of, the, of Calvary. What happened when you take communion, it's the replay, what it's being, Jesus is being killed again. And again, and again, and again. It's a replay of Calvary over and over again. Jesus said, or Paul says, you do this in remembrance of him, quoting Jesus, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. It's not a replay of his death. It's a proclamation 
of his death. You see the difference? You're not doing it over and over again. Jesus is not dying over and over and over and over and over again. You are proclaiming that Jesus died once and for all for the sins of men, and you proclaim it over and over and over and over and over again. It's the proclamation that it's an ongoing, continuously thoughtful way to proclaim the gospel, but it's not his death. We're not replaying Calvary again. Um, we're to go out to the world and tell them what happened at Calvary. Yes, but Calvary cannot be replayed. Why? The Bible. Hebrews says Jesus died once and for all. He will never die again for sin. He did it once. That's it. It is sufficient, Jesus said. It is done. It is finished. But, of course, we don't need to show God that. Um, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. And what does he have in his hands? His wounds. Amen. I saw a lamb, John said, as if he was slain. Jesus still bears the marks of his crucifixion. Absolutely. There's no need to remember, you know, remind God. God knows exactly what happens. And Jesus standing right next to him with the marks of his death. It is for us to remember. Now, Paul says, I will set in order these things. Verse 34, I will set in order. When I come back, I will set in order. But you have everything that you need. For strain it out, you got everything you need. Verse 34, right? Now, the catechism says that the words of Jesus that changes the blood and, I'm sorry, the wine and the bread into protoplasm happens when the priest recites the words that Jesus said. The problem is we don't have those words. We don't have those words. Uh, Jesus never said those words. Jesus just says, you know, do this in remembrance of me. Take this, do this, right? Very simple, right? Very simple. He never had these words that the Catholic Church says, these are the words. We said, well, where, is, where are the words? He said, well, this is what happened when Paul came back, it says. See, Paul came back and told them what the words were. Okay, to my, my contention would be, well, if it was so important, if it was the pinnacle of the worship of God, like it says, right? This is the Eucharist is the highest worship of God that you can ever have. As a Christian, you can ever have anything above the Eucharist. This is it. And we don't have the words. We don't have the words of the most important thing in the worship of a Christian life. It's not there because they say, oh yeah, it was, it was, it was verbally transmitted, not scripturally transmitted. Well, my friend, there's a big problem there because uh, I don't know if it's true or not. If these words are so important, why didn't God give them to us? Why were they written? Why would they have them? Right? Why Paul, you know, why did Paul go through the most important thing? Okay, I'm going to tell you the most important thing. And he talked about some, something superfluous thing, some side thing, instead of the most important thing, if it's true. Of course, I don't believe it's true. And it's not just me. So even the Church of England contends against it. And I don't agree with the Church of England at all, but even the Church of England says it's not right in the superstition. It cannot be found in the Bible. And I think in that point, it's right. It is superstition and it cannot be found in the Bible. And so, my friend, you make the decision. I made my decision, but you made your decision. Is what Paul said the same thing that the Catechism of Rome says? And if it's not, someone is lying and someone is telling the truth. And my friends, my dear Catholic friends and family and loved ones that maybe watch it or share, you've got to make a decision. And I would point to the Bible. I would point to the Bible and the blood of Christ who cleanses us from all sin. You don't have to go to purgatory to atone from your own. You don't have to. The blood of Christ cleanses. Second application and final one. Now, this is for us. You can say, well, I like when you talk about the Catholic Church. No, no. I like when you apply it to us. Because this is more important. That was just an answer to a question that always comes up about communion. How is it different? And this and that. But let's, let's talk about us now. A little more home. Oh, come back to the other one. Right? Remember, it's about fellowship, communion, unworthy manner. Uh, it's an example of the early church, by the way. Uh, we have the example of the early church, how they took communion. Uh, it's the Passover meal. Remember, this is centered upon what happened in Exodus. Moses, in the deliverance of Egypt, Jesus is the one that delivers us now out of Egypt, out of the world, out of sin, from the devil, right? They were delivered out of Egypt from Pharaoh. We're delivered out of the world in Satan. And ultimately, we'll go to the promised land, but that's when Jesus comes. We're still in the wilderness. 
And uh, the wilderness can be quite enticing sometimes to stay there, but don't stay in the wilderness. Keep walking with the Lord. Uh, where should it take place? So these are some questions for us. Where should communion take place? Taking of the Lord's table. What I mean by that? Taking of the Lord's. Where should it take place? Where believers are. Exactly. Where believers are. Right? Now, sometimes believers say, well, am I, I'm by myself. I take communion. Okay, that's, the, you know, that's extreme circumstances. But normally, it should be taken in a fellowship setting. Whether at a home, whether at a building, wherever believers are, it should be there. And gather church, believers together. Uh, not just for one person, but just for all of us together, right? Now, if it's just one, it's one. There's at least four people in every prayer meeting, right? There's at least... Follow that, you get it. There's at least four people in every prayer meeting. There's at least four people in every communion meeting. I don't have to spell it out, do I? Okay, good. Okay. All right. There's at least four in every meeting, even if you're by yourself. So don't worry about that part. But it's communion together. Where should it take place? At the gathering of the saints. Where do we gather? Well, sometimes we gather at uh, Amber's house. Sometimes we gather at Anthony's house. Sometimes we gather at other houses. Sometimes we gather here, often, here. Who should take part of the supper? Who should take part of communion? This is where some pastors differ from what I'm going to tell you. Uh, Some pastors have said, well, all you need to do is read verse 27 and 28, and that's it. Let everybody come and let everybody do it, and, and whoever just examines himself, just come and take it. And I've had some challenges on that because they don't read the first part of the, of the text, or the last part of the text, they just said, anyone, and I mean anyone who examines themselves can come and take communion. Um, no, my friend, the Bible forbids that. The Bible forbids that because um, who's the table for? Who is, who is at the table with Jesus? His disciples. Yeah, it is for believers. It is for disciples. It is absolutely, no doubt, the early church took it. Now, it's interesting that uh, the reason why this happens now is because in the early church, you read the book of Acts, it says many were afraid to join the church. They were afraid of joining the church and come because they saw the power of God. Nowadays, a lot of people come. And they can come to a church building and, and be around Christians and things like that, right? But at the beginning, it wasn't so. At the beginning, it was for believers, complete believers only. And this is where the disconnect is. I believe that, um, you know, the same pastors who tell you anybody can take communion, they will also make a case that not everybody can be baptized. Oh, you can't have everybody baptized. They have to be believers. So they're okay on the the baptism side. They make sure that it's for believers. But on the communion side, it's for everybody. It's inconsistent scripture, my friend. Inconsistent. Uh, You have to be consistent. If the Lord ordained baptism, which he did, then it has to be for those who are converted, those who are believers. And if the Lord instituted the Last Supper, his, his, uh, his communion, the Lord's table, then it has to be for believers. That's the consistency teaching of Scripture. Those who have been redeemed, those whom the body of Christ has been broken, those whose blood was shed for, those who are waiting for the coming of Christ. If that's you, you can take communion. If you've been redeemed, if you're waiting for Jesus to come, if you've been cleansed by his blood, if his body was broken for you, then you can come and take communion. If you wait for the Lord, for those who wait... Uh, and love his appearing. It is for the church. It is for the church. So the early church was about conversion, meaning being born again, baptism, and taking the Lord's Supper. That was, um, that was the case of the early church. But my friend, I tell you this. Um, there are people who don't have the marks of a Christian. What I mean by that is they might just say it, but their lives and their words betray them. They don't have the marks of a, a believer. And I think it is very important for church leaders uh, to not uh, deceive people into thinking that just because they took communion that they're okay with God, that they would have to repent and believe before they take communion. And it is very important, and this is where church, fellowship, leaders uh, come into play, to know that to keep sometimes people away from doing something that would harm them eventually even deceiving themselves or even judgment unto themselves because they're not discerning. They, they're not believers. They, they don't have the marks of a Christian, but they go on taking it. And there's very few people that would ever say to someone, to say, you know, brother, <laughs> uh, let's talk. Let's not take it. and Let's talk first. Let's not take, but talk. And, 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 and sometimes they just let it happen. But in 1 Corinthians 5, we're told of a person that he was not allowed to come and take communion. 
because of his grievous sins. He wasn't even allowed to come because he was so harming the body of Christ. And so it's important. Number five, in what manner, in what manner should we take it? Now, this is simple. This is, I love this because I love to do it and just show new believers. You take some bread and you break it and you pass it. You take a cup, you fill it with juice. We take it with juice. We don't take it with wine here, but we take it with juice, take, fill it up, and you pass it. And then we take it together. And that's it. You say, that's it? Yeah. What did Jesus do? Took the bread, broke it, gave it, filled the cup, passed it around, everybody drank. You see how simple it was? It wasn't this elaborate, you know, kneeling, this, procession, that, lifting, that, no, and nothing like that. It never existed like that. It was in a home, it was in fellowship, it was believers, it was passing each other, you know, and I, I'll give you something even more, maybe at this time of history, maybe even more shocking, is, uh, you know, it was the same bread. They just took a piece and passed it to the next guy and passed it to the next guy. And, you know, some germaphobes were like, oh, my, you can't do that now. You know, where's, where's Fauci? Where's the CDC? This is crazy. But that's the way they did it. Look, I, you know, you like it, don't like it, but that's the way they did it. Why? We're all one. <laughs> what's, in that bot, what's in that bread, it's mine, it's yours. We're taking it together. We're in communion with Christ. I'm not talking about being unhygienic. I'm not referring to that at all. Please don't mis misconstrue. What I'm saying is it was simple. It was fellowship. It was believers. There was no, no hoopla, no parades, nothing like that. It was, it was symbolic, of course. It has symbolism in it, but it was for the family. And where the family gather, that's where the Lord gather. Number six. I think I got one, two more, maybe, yeah. What is the meaning? Uh, we're called to mind the substitution of Christ. He, he died in my place. Comes to mind the covenant, the new covenant, which I'm being a part of now through the death of Jesus, the consummation and glory. One day he'll come and bring me home, and that awaits me, and that excites me. So it's not just a... Not just a solemn remembrance. That is true. I rem it's sober. It's sobering to think what Jesus did for the sinner. It's sobering to think. But it's also joyful to think. One day, that chair won't be empty. One day, that chair will not be empty. And we have to think of it that way when we take communion. One day, there'll be an embrace from Christ. Number seven. Uh, in what spirit do we eat it? Do I believe the facts? Have I embraced his message for me? Have I enjoyed the relationship with Christ? Do I long for his coming? Am I in fellowship with other people? Am I fully aware what this means right now, taking communion? It would be great if we could have it today, but we'll have to wait for next Sunday, uh, uh, two Sundays from now, to do it. What is it for? Why am I taking this, right? Is it just another service? Is it was just something that, you know, maybe I get a little aggravated because it happens at the end of service and I have to stay a little longer now? Is that, is that how I see it? Is that how I look at it? Do I recognize how special it is? Do I recognize how important it is to have this table before me, to remind me of what my sin cost, to remind me of what the Lord did, to remind me where I'm going and the embrace of Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit that I have now? And in my, that brother next to me or that sister next to me, do I love them? Do I have issues with them? Am I, am I wrong toward them, Lord? Have I wronged them? This is all happening at the Lord's table. It's a quick way to get things right with the Lord, by the way. <laughs> it's a quick thing. It's, it's a quick thing to get right. It's a, a pretty quick to get things right with other believers. Right? Because all that is coming to mind. You know, that's the spirit in which we take it in. That's the sobriety, but the thoughtfulness, right? And the Lord's Supper, it's a marvelous thing. Um, you know, we can react so much to Rome and how bad they, they, they have it wrong. But we could also have it wrong in our hearts, too. We can say, oh, I can't believe that. It's crazy. Yeah, I agree. But I could be just as crazy <laughs> and wrong and thinking if I hold something against you and come flauntingly to the Lord's table without ever getting things right. I could be just as wrong in my heart as they are in their doctrine. And that's something the Lord knows. And that's something the Lord doesn't want because he wants to rekindle that love in our hearts for him, for others, 
the great gospel, the centrality of the truth. And before I take communion, all that, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, right? It's not something I have to contrive and, you know, work it up, work it up, work it up. I'm aware of what I'm doing and the expectation of the Lord's return. Think about that chair. I'm sure the disciples, after Jesus had that supper, said, man, I wish Jesus was here. I long for that chair to be full again. And my friend, they did it. And, uh, and Jesus didn't come for them at that moment in time. They went to see Jesus. But one day, my friend, that's, that seat is going to be filled. That chair is going to have a person in there. And that, pers- and that person is going to be your Lord. And that's the beauty of the expectation of Christ, uh, that we know that table that we come and take communion. It's just getting us ready, getting us ready and getting us holy to meet him. And, um, and to come to the table without thinking those things is sin. To just haphazardly come and just, oh, just give me that. Give me that bread, you know. Come on, pastor, get on with it, right? And, uh, and, or to neglect it. I'm not going to take it. That's weird. I'm not going to take it. Well, Jesus said to do it. Would you do it? Right? If you don't, that is sin, my friend. And, um, and to reject his body, to reject his people is also sin. And so uh, this is what the meaning of the, of, of, the ta- of the Lord's table is. And I pray that I, I've never fully, completely taught on it because I was waiting for 1 Corinthians 11. I always give you bits and pieces throughout the whole time, right? Bits and pieces. But I was waiting for this. I think it's right. I think it's for us to remember that, that our absent Lord is here present through the lives of believers today. Because the same Lord who saved you is in every one of our hearts was born again. He's here through his spirit. And so even though that seed is empty, personally empty, he's also here through his people. And how I treat his people is how I treat Christ. If I ignore people, I ignore Christ. If I treat you wrong, I treat Christ wrong. If I am belligerent and unloving, toward I'm unloving toward Christ. Despite the words I say, despite of what I say, it doesn't really matter because it is to embrace his body. One day we will embrace his physical body in a sense of his resurrected glorious body. But today we can have the opportunity to embrace his body, his believers. And one of the highest privileges to have is to know um, that our feeble love, our weak love can be fed by his spirit every time we come to him. And every time we take communion, we're fed by him, strengthened by him, encouraged by him. How often? As often as you take it. Until when? Until he comes. Is there a fountain that ever flows, right? It's like a fountain that keeps flowing. Amen. And that's a, uh, that is filled with Emmanuel's vein, the, the beautiful hymn says, right? There's a, there's a fountain that flows uh, from Emmanuel's vein. His blood cleanses us from all sin, and it's the highest privilege to, to take communion. I would love to take communion today. It sort of leave me a little bit of an empty feeling, but I should have thought about it more. Uh, but let's pray. And uh, ask the Lord to really teach us that. And maybe, maybe tonight with your family, um, you can go home and partake of that with your family, with your loved ones, and, and take it and really think what we just talked about. I think it's very precious to think what the Lord has done for us. And, and I think it's very precious to also think how the Corinthians get it all messed up. Well, my friend, how can we get it all messed up? <laughs> I know better than that. I can fall into the same traps. And that's what we ask the Lord, to keep us from those sins. Keep us from presumptuous sins. So, Lord, we do commit to you this time. We do thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Lord, help us to do your good pleasure. Help us not to fall into uh, grievous sins that affect you. And we pray, Lord, that you help us in our understanding of the gospel and our understanding of the truth. We do thank you, Lord, that uh, you gave us this text, this word, this reality, and help us to conform to it. We long to be conformed, Lord, to the image of you, your son Jesus. We pray that the Holy Spirit would grab a hold of us, Lord, and we would surrender each part of our lives so that we would become like you. Lord, we confess that there are times where we have not discerned your body the right way. There are times, Lord God, where we might even come to your table with wrong motives and wrong belief and behavior and thought. 
and even sin, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for treating this as a casual thing, neglecting the table, neglecting your commands. And Lord, we wouldn't be any of, of any good unless we repent, unless we come to you. Lord, we can have the right teachings. We have the wrong behavior. It profits us nothing. For Lord, without love, love for you and love for the brethren, we would be nothing. So Lord, engage us in our hearts. Engage us where we failed. Engage us where we're in some areas weak, in some areas where we may be doing better. But Lord, those areas where we need strengthening and areas where we need your word, please allow your Holy Spirit, Lord, to come and really dig deep in us, Lord, so that we would be, uh, Lord, serving you, serving your body for your good pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.